Mr. Shands, have we heard from Matt Daggett? Everything? Oh, okay. Oh, he did. Well, I'm glad he allowed us to do that. Just before we get started, Matt, uh, Matt was robbed. And uh, where's the chief? Oh, there he is. Yeah. And uh, how long did it take us to get that guy? Less than 24 hours. Amazing. Frank's going to be unable to be with us tonight. He had an emergency pop up. So with that said, uh, the City of Castle Hills, November 9th, 2016. I'm calling to order the regular City Council meeting at 6.30 p.m. and determine whether a quorum is present. A quorum is present. And at this time, I would... Uh, like to ask Sergeant Hart to lead the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you, Sergeant. Okay. Next on the agenda, item two is acknowledgments and announcements. Uh, Chief Davis, would you like to uh, let us know about the Terracon acknowledgement and appreciation, please? You bet, Mayor Council. Uh, thanks for this time. I'm really gonna turn this over to Sergeant Hart, but I'll highlight a few things up front. Uh, Terracon has been with us in the city for quite some time. They had an appreciation fundraiser for the police department a couple of weeks ago. Um, unbeknownst to me, they did this out of the goodness of their heart. They just felt like giving back to the local law enforcement and we truly appreciate it. And they have raised uh, a little over $1,500 for the police department and what that purchased as you will find in the foyer on each side of the building, is display cases um, that we will uh, show off some of our achievements and some of our older um, police equipment for uh, the pleasure of your viewing. So with that said, uh, Sergeant Hart, would you like to say a few words for the nice Terracon folks that did that wonderful thing for us? Yes, uh, Terracon, uh, Ms. Wolf approached me a couple months ago about wanting to do something for the department. And we kind of went back and forth about what they were budgeting and uh, what we could use. And we, we arrived at a figure and then they, they had their appreciation night at, at Aggie Park. Um, it was a really big success. They, uh, they had a little casino night and uh, dinner and invited the officers down and it was just it was a real, really nice show of support. Um, unexpected, it was, but it was terrific. And uh, we'd like to have uh, them come up and we have a little something for them also. Sure. I'll get a picture. I'll do the photograph this time. Bring them up. Yes. Sure. Um, I just thought it was important that we give back to the community. You guys have always been very supportive of our needs here in the community, and we have a great relationship with you. We just wanted to uh, show you how much Blue Lives Matter and, and how much we appreciate your support and coming out whenever we need you. And I uh, just wanted to let you know that we're here for you. So that's what this is all about. I just like to, we've got a little something for men. The Castle Hills Police Department would like to recognize and thank Terracon consultants and their employees for the sincere and generous support of our officers. Thank you very much. You, 
got it. And I hope you don't mind. Yeah. And if you don't mind, <coughs> we'll put you on our Facebook page if there's no objections. Okay. All right. Here we go. And let me get one with Terry Collins going. Oops. That's it. Got it. Yes, that's right. Awesome. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, thanks again. Very, very much. Very appreciated. Okay. Um, the next item is something that uh, has been long overdue, but I want to recognize a couple of our employees uh, and during municipal court week. So uh, Tina and Vicki, would you mind coming to the front, please? Okay. Our next announcement is item 2C, which is uh, an announcement regarding the Zoning Review Committee. And this was a committee set up a number of months ago, and what they did basically was go through our existing uh, zoning ordinances. Uh, it, the board was headed up by Mark Schnall. Many of you might uh, have remembered Mark in uh, past days uh, within the city of Castle Hills. Mike, did you want to comment on this at all or did you want me to take it from there? Okay, good. Um, so what this announcement is about is a zoning review committee recommendations will be presented to the zoning commission on December the 7th at 7 p.m. Now, these will be re revised or tweaked or uh, what, uh, what they've come up with. Uh, zoning will take a look at it, and then, of course, it'll be presented to council before we make any changes. 
So that's, uh, if you mark your calendars for December 7th at 7 o'clock, I can assure you that's going to be a lively meeting. The next item is item D, and uh, this is one that's uh, near and dear to my heart here. Uh, as you both know, uh, as everyone knows, there's a considerable amount of our budget that goes towards uh, the infrastructure of this city. And it, it came to my attention that we have probably in charge of these committees, uh, Douglas, you're in charge of drainage. And um, I, I don't think there, there's a, a drainage outlet in this city that Douglas Gregory hasn't walked down. Uh, whenever, whenever anything comes up about drainage or finance or how much we're spending on this or, or what we need to do next or whatever, I, I've always turned to Douglas because uh, he knows. Uh, secondly, we have uh, John Squire, who has been heading up our street program. We're currently in phase two. We've completed phase one. We have a very aggressive plan to try to uh, pay as you go at the moment before we enter into any type of other funding, not to say there will be, just, and uh, so far we've been able to spend around a million dollars a year, if I'm not mistaken, in, in streets. Uh, like I said, we're in phase two now. Um, we've got some very important things going on, uh, even in the San Antonio proposed budget of some uh, massive flooding that's been going on since before I can remember, and I'm 62, uh, in the Lock Hill Selma uh, West Avenue area. And we've, of course, had uh, numer numerous meetings with... Uh, Joe Cryer, along with uh, Art Reinhardt and uh, different panels. What I'm getting around to is I think it's time that we combine the street committee and the drainage committee to be merged into a single street and drainage committee. And uh, so I've spoken to the two committee chairs and they have agreed that uh, they would at least get together and uh, join these two committees into something that because of the different things that are going on with the San Antonio budget, we need to be totally focused as one on moving forward as their budget goes through the system and that $37 million proposal that they have is uh, being considered. So, uh, they're going to unify their efforts. Uh, we're going to expand the committee a little bit uh, with a couple of new members, which we'll probably announce at the next meeting. Uh, but they're uh, fully qualified members. And come, say, January 1st, somewhere around in that area, because that, I think, will be the next time we meet. Is that correct? Because Rick is out. Rick is out uh, with an operation we'll be up and ready to go. So uh, I want to thank you too for your service. Uh, as you know, if you've driven around Castle Hills, you've seen that we have a, uh, quite a bit of construction going on. Uh, it's hand in hand with uh, saws and uh, of course they're paying for, paying for some of this too. And I, like I said, I don't, I don't know that we'll be able to kick off phase two before the end of the year, but I do know that uh, those streets are under consideration and will be finalized once this new committee meets. So other than that, thank you gentlemen for your service. I can't, uh, we're, we're really moving along here for the first time ever. We have a, a concrete street program. We have a concrete uh, drainage plan in the first time of the city. And uh, building ways to pay for it through our new advertising with our uh, billboards on 410 and also our proposed in the future billboards up military highway. So with that said, Kim, do we have anybody under citizens to be heard signed up? Nobody there, okay. So item three on the agenda is citizens to be heard and no one signed up. The next item is the 
consent agenda, which item four is consider the approval of the October 2016 treasurer's report. Consider requesting Consider the, oh, consider the, I'm sorry, consider the approval of the October 16 treasurer's report, consider approval of the September 13th, 2016 special and regular city council meetings minutes, consider the approval of the September 26th, 2016 special council meeting minutes, consider the approval of October the 11th, 2016 regular city council minutes, Consider the approval of October 26th special city council meeting minutes. Is there anyone who would like to pull any one of these items for discussion? Douglas? The treasurer's report, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, Suzanne's not here, so I'll have to ask Mr. Shins. Under uh, IT support under account number 0110-5041, it's 82% over budget for the year. What did we miss when we made the budget last year and what should we be looking at for the budget next year? Zero one ten fifty forty one under IT support. We're eighty two point thirty one percent over budget. I remember asking Suzanne about that because it's about, you're right, it's about $6,000 over budget. And it, I'm trying to remember, help me, Wayne, what was it, which one was it? Okay. Right. We're served by Barcom for our IT department and we had a lot of server problems that were unanticipated and that's where the $6,000 went. Should we budget accordingly next year? We should not have the same thing occur again this quickly. It should be that that should last for three or four years at least. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's all. Council, as a, just as a uh, caveat here, I'm going to be asking starting uh, in the December meeting that our finance director uh, attend our city council meetings, Mike. We can get that done. For, I mean, we talked about that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have the consent agenda. Questions have been answered. Or no, no changes, Douglas, in your comments on that. Okay, thank you very much. So we have the consent agenda. Do I have a motion for the consent agenda? Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? It is unanimous. Thank you. Okay, the next item is the regular agenda. Five, discuss and consider entering into an interlocal agreement with the VIA Metropolitan Transit for funding of transit infrastructure and improvements within the city of Castle Hills. We do have representatives from VIA here tonight that will give a presentation on this item and answer any questions. Before we get started, sir, do we have anybody signed up for this item? Nobody has signed up for this item. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would you like to introduce? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. My name is Leroy Alloway. I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations for Via Metropolitan Transit. And joining me this evening is Shauna Russell, Senior Vice President of Public Engagement, Gary Glasscock, Vice President of Fleet and Facilities, and Jeff Bazan, our Suburban City Policy and Government Relations Analyst for the agency. So hopefully between one of us, we'll be able to answer questions that you may have. We do have a brief presentation to walk through, uh, outlining how we got to this point and the process moving forward. Again, as a way of reminder, VIA serves 14 member cities comprising 1,213 square miles we provided last year over 42 million passenger trips between our VIA trans service and our fixed route service. We've got 7,200 bus stops, 90 routes, and 478 buses within our fleet. 
Within Castle Hills, of course, we have our fixed route service, our via trans paratransit service, and then van full service available as well. We do have 79 stops in and adjacent to Castle Hills. And as part of the realignment of Route 534 that was previously undertaken, we did install eight next-gen shelters. Now our next-gen shelters are the more, are the more modern-looking modular shelters, as you can see on this slide. All of those shelters do feature the custom roof with the city seal of Castle Hills. And as part of a pilot program, we've been testing out with the deployment of the 1,000 new shelters that we've been putting in over the last two years, we have started putting solar lighting into the shelters. The solar process was designed in-house by VIA staff using off-the-shelf components. And so we do have 30 of those shelters in place with that type of lighting throughout our service area today. Um, we're hearing a lot of positives about this with the increased visibility that it's bringing. And so we will be looking in the coming months to deploy solar on additional shelters throughout the service area. Primarily looking at those areas where there is not an adjacent street light or enough ambient light that the shelter and the solar would not come on. Again, just as a way of recap, in 2015, we provided a little over half a million trips serving Castle Hills. You can see the routes that are listed on the screen that also touch this community. And then, of course, our VIA Trans service, 21 registered VIA Trans users within Castle Hills, but trips into and out of Castle Hills in 2015, over a little over 2,000 trips. What we're specifically talking about tonight, though, is our suburban cities funding program, as well as our passenger amenities enhancements. We have committed $12 million in what we call our next-gen shelters, our passenger amenities program. From 1978 through 2014, VIA was able to deploy just over 1,300 shelters into our service area. By the time this $12 million allocation is expended, and we anticipate that being the end of this calendar year, bleeding possibly into the first quarter of 2017, we'll have added 1,000 new shelters. So we will actually have 2,300 shelters in our service area. 95% of all boardings will happen at a shelter and 99% of all boardings will happen at least with a bench, if not a shelter combined. In addition, we do have an allocation that was received from the Alamo Area Metropolitan Planning Organization from their Surface Transportation Program Metropolitan Mobility Funds that allocated $2 million to VIA. This funding was transferred from Federal Highways to the Federal Transit Administration, which put some restrictions on the usage of the funding. We are able to use that $2 million for passenger amenities, such as shelters, benches, bus pullouts, bus pads, making compli ensuring compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, signage, sidewalk connections, bike parking, and lighting. The biggest limitation is we are not able to come in and resurface a road from end to end. We have to do an improvement related to the VIA system and the passenger amenities that we offer. The $2 million, or $2 million allocation was determined by our Board of Trustees to then be earmarked specifically for our suburban member cities. And so we did apply a formula to determine the funding allocation to be applied on our 13 member cities other than the city of San Antonio. Again, it was looking at the ratio of miles per city to the total number of suburban city miles that we serve. You can see some of the um, eligible improvements upon the screen. But based on this funding, funding formula, the allocation from the $2 million coming to Castle Hills is $380,652. Now we have worked with city management and council over the last few months to bring forward the proposed list of projects for your consideration this evening as part of the interlocal agreement. We are looking at ways to improve and enhance seven existing stops these stops will receive bus stopping pads within the roadway. The bus pads are 160 feet in length and are 10 inches thick of concrete. Three of the stops will receive new shelters with full ADA connections. And two will be connected with a new pedestrian acti activated mid-block crossing. And we'll walk through the specific locations in a moment. 
Now, as part of this, we've also looked at the existing number of stops and how we can increase some efficiency in the corridor. And so we do have seven stops that have, I will say, recordings of zero boardings or disembarkings that we're recommending be consolidated. So we will have seven improved stops in the corridor. They will be consolidated, but it'll be an over, a better overall operation for this route and for the community. It may be easier to see this map on the handout that you have, but we can start walking through it from Northwest Military heading south. And so you can see that at Northwest Military and West Avenue, we are proposing the bus pad, sidewalk connection, and shelter bat pad be in place or be installed through this funding. We're looking at bus pads at Hibiscus to consolidate the stops from West Castle Lane and East Castle Lane on West Avenue with the Hibiscus locations. And then on slide 12, looking at putting in the bus pads, sidewalk connection, shelter pad, and a pedestrian crossing at Antonian High School. And then including the bus stopping pads in front of the HEB at Loop 410 and West. And specifically, we have included in the interlocal the projects that end stop IDs where the bus stopping pads will be installed. And then the proposed improvements. So for example, at West Avenue and Northwest Military, a rendering of what we're envisioning, installing the bus stopping pad, the shelter pad, a next gen shelter, and ADA connections to allow for access to this shelter. Again, at West and Castle Oaks, the shelter pads, ADA connections, bus stopping pads, and the pedestrian activated mid-block crossing. The proposed scope is based on a 60% design at this point. We will be advancing it to 100% design. I believe Councilman, you and I had spoken earlier, and I need to apologize, I misspoke thinking we were at 90, but the plants that I have with me is at 60% tonight. So these numbers do have a contingency built in. Based on the contingency at this point, we're estimating $368,000 in total construction cost to be funded out of the suburban city allocation. So $380,000 in the total budget, $368,000 is what we're estimating with the contingency built in. Out of our passenger amenities program, the $12 million I referenced at the beginning, we will be providing $45,000 from that pot of money for those three next-gen shelters. And so this interlocal represents a $413,000 investment for the passengers in and around Castle Hills, should it be approved this evening. Our next steps, assuming council approves this this evening, will be then to take it to the VIA Board of Trustees for their concurrence with the interlocal agreement. Once that's reached, we will then advance the plan set to 100% and put it out for bid. And with that, I'm glad to take any questions that you may have. Let's start to the left tonight, if you don't mind. Uh, Mr. Trevino, did you have any comments or questions for the gentleman, please? Uh, Mr. Alloway, thank you for the presentation. As I understand, the Hawk, is it the Hawk Crosswalk, that's correct? Correct. So that will provide a point for people to cross and also ideally serve as a method of slowing down traffic in a school zone area. Correct. It's a push button activated traffic signal. So it is a on-demand signal. I'm sorry, not traffic signal, but pedestrian signal. Uh, solar powered. And so we have seen success throughout the service area of this type of application being applied on a number of other corridors based on the engineering analysis that's been done, CLOTS has recommended that we use this application in this corridor. Okay, so that was, uh, that was upon uh, CLOTS's recommendation? Yes, we asked them to look at what pedestrian amenities could be added for safety, and they've come back with this recommended recommendation for the Hawk signal and the pedestrian crossing. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trevino. Mr. Daggett, did you have any questions or comments for the gentleman? Where will that be again? In front of Antonian High School. And on that one slide a few back, it said closing or something? What, what yeah, so there are seven stops that we're recommending 
be consolidated okay. with the improvements. So these are stops currently that simply have the flag pylon, if you like to refer to it that way, um, at their location. But based on the ridership that we're seeing, it may be one person boarding or disembarking at that location. And so looking at the overall walk shed, uh, we believe the consolidation with shelter improvements, with sidewalk improvements, will help attract riders to those central locations and provide for increased ridership as well as increased efficiency in the corridor. And can you explain the sidewalk improvement areas? Sure, so if we look on slide 11, at each stop location, so let me back up, um, at Northwest Military and West Avenue, we will be putting in sidewalk connections up to the stops. Uh, let me pull that image up. So as you may see on the screen, um, it will be sidewalk connections up to the shelter location. It will not necessarily go the full length of the corridor, but enough for a passenger to be able to access the shelter if they're mobility impaired and be able to also exit the bus. Uh, we do have a requirement that because our buses can kneel for ADA compliance and deploy a ramp, we have to have a smooth surface and a level surface for them to be able to do that safely. And so this will accommodate that. So that would be at west and northwest and then at the pedestrian crossing in front of Antonian High School. Okay. But it will not be, I, I know there have been concerns in the past that we were going to come in and put sidewalks entire lengths of streets. That is not the case here. It's in advance of the shelter to allow for access and for disembarking from the bus. Okay, that's all I have. I have some questions, but I'm gonna wait until, John, did you have any questions or comments for the gentleman? There you go. Yes, I do, Mayor, thank you, Lord. Thanks for being here, I appreciate uh, your sharing the plans. A couple things, uh, first of all, a question to Mr. Brennan. Um, on, the, uh, on the contract that was written, uh, or the, the center local agreement, have you, have you reviewed the center local agreement and found anything that we need to be uh, concerned about that's not in the best interest of the city or may bind us in any way that, that would be potentially detrimental to the city? Uh, I have reviewed it, and there was an addition made to paragraph uh, two, E that uh, was uh, beneficial to the city and a deletion that was also beneficial to the city and uh, it's that's been agreed upon by VIA and uh, we certainly recommend it to you all as, as, as amended or, or doctored in, in your packet. As amended, correct? Yes, okay. Thank you, Mike. Yes. Um, the actual, the, uh, the pedestrian crossing that you referred to, yes, sir. that's a, basically a flashing light, correct? It's not a, it's not, it won't, it won't stop traffic, it'll just inform traffic, is that correct? correct? It's, it is not warranted for a full traffic signal, but it is advanced beacons to let traffic know that there is someone waiting to cross. It will be striped, it will be signed. Okay, so there'll be, there'll be a pedestrian crosswalk striped in there all the way yes, across. Sir. The flashing signal, Chief, does that require drivers to slow down to any certain speed or? Unless it's posted, but I think it's just cautionary. <coughs> correct, it is just a cautionary signal. Now, if there is a pedestrian in the crosswalk, you have to stop, is that correct? I believe so, I double checked that, but I believe the crosswalk should have priority with the traffic light. Okay, okay. Um, I know we brought up the idea of sidewalks. I'm just wondering, Mike, in our codes, do we have any requirements for sidewalks for commercial enterprises when somebody puts in a, a, a new business or do we, are, are we requiring sidewalks to be put in? I do not think so, no. Is that something we can look at? Sure. Have it, and please have a discussion on? Thank you. Um, okay. The, uh, the next gen shelters that you brought up, I, I saw some Northwest military that uh, with the solar lighting that comes on at night and it's very well lit, which is nice to see, um, but it's not on all of them on Northwest military. Uh, I do know some of them are located next to, uh, next to some street lights. Um, are all these gonna be lit? 
so the challenge that we have with these shelters, at this point we only have 30 in the system that have the solar lighting installed. We've been doing it as a pilot program. Okay. The way the system has been designed, receiving five and a half hours of sunlight each day is enough to charge the battery to operate for a full 24 hours of light. Okay. The solar cell will not come on, however, if there's adjacent ambient light that <coughs> would make it think there's still the sun out. So we are looking to be very strategic at where we place those solar cells and batteries. So really, if it's got adjacent street lighting, we may not put a solar cell in that shelter because it may never come on. But we are looking through that. Again, we've got the 30 that have been piloted. Mm -hmm. But as we move to the full deployment, those are the type of details we will still be ironing out. I don't know if Mr. Glassclock would like to add more to that. Can I comment just on it real quick for, for the benefit of the riders? You know, and looking at those, the ones that are lit um, and the ones that aren't, aren't lit the next to a street light, the light that's out, the, the output of that lighting is significant. I mean, I think it really makes it safer for somebody if, as they're waiting for a bus, especially this time of day right now. Um, helps drivers see them if they're coming by. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't see why you wouldn't try to outfit as many of those as you can with lighting interiorly, even if they're relatively near a, a street light. But go ahead, I'm, thank you for the comment. Uh, Councilman, excellent point, and uh, I can probably elaborate a little more on our plans for that particular program. The uh, 30 installations that we have now, as, as Leroy mentioned, really are pilot program. We put together a system in-house and we wanted to make sure that it worked properly before we went out on a large scale. So uh, we're pretty satisfied that this thing, uh, our system is working well. We've, we've mm -hmm. received positive uh, comments throughout the service area. So here's how we, we uh, plan to proceed. We've got two different uh, things going simultaneously. One is a large scale procurement for a system where we can start uh, uh, deploying on a much larger scale. The next thing we're doing uh, that, that uh, we should be starting right after the first of the year is we're gonna be uh, conducting a complete site assessment of every bus stop that we have in the system. One of the measured items will be ambient lighting during the evening. And wherever we see that there is a issue, as Leroy mentioned, uh, uh, insignificant ambient lighting in that particular area, we plan to install a uh, solar package. So our goal next year uh, we've set tentatively is to install 300 uh, solar lighting systems and then continue that program so that every shelter that we have where it meets criteria will within the next uh, two to three years include solar lighting similar to what uh, what you just described. Um, would it be uh, forward of me to ask the question, I guess I'll go ahead and ask it anyways, uh, the stops uh, around HEB, the two stops there. I know there's some street lighting in that area, but they're also heavily used. And, um, and also the stops uh, for Antonian, where you may get a lot of student ridership or teachers uh, or uh, you know, other, other individuals that are working to the school. Are those being considered for lighting at this point or not? Or do you, have, do you know? Um, at this point, really every stop is being considered, but we can certainly bring those to the uh, forefront of the program take a look at them early on, uh, make an assessment, and, and if we think uh, it'll work, we'll certainly do it. Okay, okay, appreciate that. I already asked this question, Mike, I just wanna double check to make sure, as far as financial obligations, as far as you know, doing this contract, there is no obligations on the city financially for, for uh, VIA uh, putting this infrastructure in our city. Is that correct? That's right, and, and while you're on that, also we should verify once again, once it's done, who's responsible for what? Because they will, as I understand, they will maintain the shelters if some if a car hits it, uh, but then we will take over the infrastructure. Can you elaborate? For example, on the crossing for the streets and everything, after, after they're installed, it would be our responsibility to replace or repair and maintain the structures themselves will be considered, as I recall, something like uh, equipment or facilities, a via. And so if there's any damage to the next-gen shelters, they would be responsible for that. Okay. 
the signage and the lights and the push button and all of that was one that I never did get exactly clear. So we should verify that right now. Who's going to be responsible for the crossing notification early warning devices that are on signposts on, in city right away? Okay. So I believe what's in the agreement now and what we've done with the other suburban cities, uh, items such as the bus stopping pads and, uh, and as you mentioned, the crosswalk would be covered by the city looking out. Uh, everything related to that shelter, including the concrete pad, solar installation, would, uh, will be covered by VIA. Okay. So every, everything that, d uh, that uh, um, is required with the passenger boardings we will handle. Okay, okay. Um, I appreciate your answer. I mean, as, in regards to the concrete pads, I mean, that's going to be way more durable than what we have in place right now. So that does not concern me in the least. I mean, these are going to be very, I assume, very sufficient. Uh, these are going to be, well, for lack of better terms, very thick, sufficient pads, correct? I mean, you take the weight of the bus and. Correct. And it's a uh, 160 feet in length and 10 inches thick of concrete. So this is the same standard we're Each using. Is, how long again, I'm sorry? 160 feet in length okay, and 10 inches thi uh, thick of concrete. That's all eight. Ten, ten inches thick concrete. That's a lot of concrete. That's a lot of concrete. And okay. these are the same standards we're using throughout our service area with, I don't believe we've had any problems with our bus stopping pads. As far as insulation, you're going to make sure that the ground is sufficient to support it, the compaction and everything's done properly. Yes, sir. Okay. Is there going to be a warranty uh, for, your, for the work? To you all? We will have a warranty uh, workmanship, materials, uh, and design with our contractors. So okay. we'll hold them responsible for any issues that may show up early on. Okay. And it's only going to be one crossing light, is that correct? It's one installation set. We do have the plan sheets here. I believe it's a total of eight lights. In total. And that one crossing location. Advanced warning at the crossing itself, and then replicating on each side. Okay. 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 He has no questions. Thank you, John. No, thank you. Uh, Douglas, did you have any uh, questions or comments for the gentleman, please? Good evening. Are, in the contract, you use the term project improvements. Are project improvements interchangeable with the term maintenance improvements? I'm not sure what you're referring to with maintenance improvements, Councilman. On the thing you had up here, suburban cities assume responsibility for maintenance of improvements other than shelters, benches, signage, back racks, bike racks, and bus stops. In the contract you have, the project improvements are inclusive of certain transit and passenger infrastructure. So are project improvements also maintenance improvements? So the project improvements that are being discussed in this interlocal councilman are those that are described in Exhibit A that we've just walked through. So as they're the same thing, it's on this page. Yes, sir. Okay. So, however, as we've pointed out, once we have installed the improvements, so for example, the bus pads, the maintenance of those bus pads, should there be any needed outside of the warranty period that our contract will assign to us for the work that we procure, would then be the responsibility of the community. Whose responsibility is it now? At this point, sir, it's dependent upon who owns the roadway itself. Now these bus pads, you ought to see your bus pad ac across from Gold's Gym. It is a wreck and a ruin on that road and it's been there for better part of 18 months now. There's a deep gouge in the street, goes down a significant way where obviously the tires of the buses have been in front of that bus pad. It looks horrible. Now, I'm really concerned with the phrase you say, the bus pads will be, the assumption of the replacement of the bus pads will be assumed by the city looking out. These are not little uh, $5,000 projects, are they? How much does an average bus pad cost to replace? So let me pull that cost slide up for you, Councilman. So based on current dollars, we're looking at approximately $39,000 all-in cost to install the bus pad, not including design. And how many bus pads are we 
asked to take on the obligation to fix when they go bad. I, I can count at least one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven bus pads. So we're, we're asked to take on an obligation of seven bus pads and each one is going to replace, be replaced at some time in the future of around $40,000 each. Is that correct? Based on current dollars, yes, sir. So that's $280,000 of current dollars that we're going to be expected to replace or we'll just leave a dilapidated bus pad there, which at the present time, who owns the street has the responsibility to replace that? Yes, sir. Now, going to the... the um, Going to the shelter, um, Mr. Shands talked about this, and I just, you know, just need a little clarification. The solar power equipment, if it's stolen, who has to pay for the replacement of it? That's covered by VIA, sir. By what? By VIA? By VIA. Forever? Yes, sir. As long as the shelter is in place, we maintain the shelter. Okay. Um, I am concerned about in Article 2, Section E of this agreement. Now, fortunately, you did strike out a line in the section that said any cost overrun shall be paid by and be the sole responsibility of the city. I appreciate that. Thank you. But it also goes on to say that if sufficient funds for the project, and I added for the project, are not available, the party shall in good faith and expeditionally work together to determine what the remaining portion of the project, if any, can be completed with the balance of the funds. If it is determined that no portion can be fully completed, this agreement shall terminate, and any remaining funds shall be returned to the STPMM. Now that's curious. If you have a project and you've gone, if you have a fixed amount of money that's been set aside, that you all have set aside for it, and you find there's a cost overrun that goes beyond that, obviously you'd stop as each section of the project is going on. You're saying that you would leave a project in midair if we don't agree to come up with the money for the cost overrun of the project. That is how I read that. Is, am I misreading it? Yes, sir, I will say you are misreading it. Okay, that. help me. At this point, we have a 60% estimate before you for $368,000. Included in the 60% design estimate is a contingency within each of those items. As we get to 100% set of plans to go out for bid, then we will submit this to, a lo to the lowest qualified bidder through our procurement process. At that time, if the estimates have come in and they're in excess of the $380,000 that's allocated to this program, then we will determine collectively which of those portions of the project do not move forward. But this is not saying that if there is a cost overrun in advance of the construction, we would walk away from construction. We will review this once the bids have come in. This is the engineering estimate, but the actual construction estimate, construction cost, will be provided by the contractor. And at that point, we can review. I appreciate that clarification. That makes sense. Um, Mike, maybe you can help Mike Brennan, maybe you can help me understand Article 3 of the contract. City shall be solely responsible for obtaining legal access to any site where transit infrastructure is to be constructed under this agreement. I guess all this under this agreement really doesn't, there's nothing that we really have to worry about because there's nothing that we have to access through somebody's property, is that correct? Well, it's my assumption that, uh, that there will be a mutual agreement as to where the location of the improvements will be. And Is uh, that assumption correct? Yes, sir. There will be easements needed for the shelter pads and shelter locations. Um, these de vary depending upon the final designs that are ultimately approved. But the acquisition of those easements <coughs> We do routinely look to our member cities to provide that easement and the necessary right of way to construct the projects. So does that mean, Mr. Brennan, that we would have to go and condemn any property that would have to be used for those easements, if any? Well, I wouldn't, uh, the city could just say no, we're not going to agree to Correct. do that. And if we don't have the necessary right of way 
to build the improvement, then that would be a modification we would make. But based on the plan sets that have been drawn up to this point, we do see there are slivers of right of way that would be needed. Um, I believe we're looking maybe 15 feet at small amounts of right of way to be able to accommodate the shelter pad and the bus stop itself. But again, if that easement is unable to be acquired, then we can look at modifying the plans. It may require though that we remove the next gen shelter or look at other modifications that could help fit the project into the existing right of way that we have. Let me ask another question. Now you all are paying this money through a grant or through your maintenance fund? Correct, a grant. If you didn't have that grant, would you have felt an obligation to fit the, to replace the bus pads as they deteriorated? We would not have had the ability to do that, sir. Mm -hmm. So what the current law is, is it law or statute or what? that says uh, the bus pads which you're putting down to put the buses through our city of which you get one half a 1% sales tax revenue, we have to pay for that. Is that under an ordinance from San Antonio? Is it a state ordinance? Is it what? The chapter 451, sir, that governs the operations of metropolitan transit agencies throughout the state provide that we have the ability and authority to make use of all public right of way and specifically roadways in this case. Um, does not provide for, for street improvements. And in this case, the Federal Transit Administration also limits our ability to being able to do bus pads to help extend the life of a street, but we are not able to go in and resurface a street from end to end. So there are limitations on how we can use these funds, but we are following our state code as to how this agreement has been constructed and to how we operate. So you're telling me that there is a state code Yes, sir. Chapter that's by the state legislature. Texas transportation. That says you can come into a city and tear up a city through a bus pad, and it's the city's responsibility to fix the damage that you all have caused. No, sir. I'm saying Chapter 451 authorizes us to use public thoroughfares for the operation of our system. Yes, but that doesn't answer my question. My question was Did the statute passed by the state? give you authority to come into a city and use their streets, which you say is yes, and if you damage their streets, we're responsible for the damage that you cause on our streets. Is that correct? Let me ask Ms. Russell to come up and address right. that for you, Councilman. I'm not sure I'm gonna tell you what you'd like to hear, but I'll, I'll take I another crack at what, it. I just wonder what is. <laughs> yeah, so um, I would say that the three of us, none of us are here as VA legal counsel. I'm, I'm happy to forward that question to our legal staff. I'm also happy to look at the code when we get back. I think it is much like um, anything that's put into the stream of commerce within the city of Castle Hills, much like a trash truck or a truck delivering Coles tennis shoes or any other thing. I, and my understanding under the law is that we have those same um, provisions, liabilities, guarantees, those kinds of things. But it doesn't specifically speak to the question you're asking as I understand it. But I'm happy to follow up. Well, I would think that's rather important to know the answer to that. The reason I'm asking that is because we are under very tight funds in this city to try to address our infrastructure problem. And if we're about to assume a lob obligation of almost four, let's see, 40 times seven, almost $300,000 in current dollars to fix bus pads that you're putting down that the buses may damage, that's a lot of money for up for a little town to come up with. And um, I just don't know how everybody would look at that because it's just sort of peculiar to me that if you do the damage, we do the repair. That, that just uh, is sort of odd. And um, thank you. May I, may I get them to comment on that? Sure. I mean, I, I back the idea of bus pads, Douglas, because I know the value, I know the just how <coughs> rugged these, these monolithic structures are. <coughs> we're already tearing up West Avenue today, and we're going to have to fix West Avenue. This is, this, these pads are in place specifically to mitigate this type of damage that is going on today. I mean, you call it damage, you call it road use, you call it road wear, but if you look at West Avenue where these buses are stopping, it's already raveling. And, and it's, having, it's having issues. It was a very well-built road, but it's already having some issues. 
And these bus paths are designed specifically to, to stop that kind of problem from happening as these buses are braking and slowing and transferring all that energy in back, in, back into the pavement. That's why they're built so heavy and so stout. So if, there, if there's a way to comment on that, I mean, I want to make, obviously, I want to make sure we have, you have a good product and you have an excellent warranty um, that, that, you know, we don't have to assume any additional maintenance. But, you know, is there any way you can comment on that? I mean, I think what we're doing is, is we're protecting our streets, um, protecting West Avenue, where these buses are stopping or slowing down to a stop. Okay. The bus pad design that we're using is actually a city of San Antonio design. And the city of San Antonio has installed a number of these pads uh, throughout uh, at, at our particular stops. And they've held up uh, extremely well. Um, we have not installed any bus pads other than in the city of Kirby. And that was uh, just recently. Uh, we did uh, cover the costs of bus pads that were installed by Leon Valley, but Leon Valley installed them themselves under under one of their contracts. And we simply covered the cost. We did, however, provide them with that same design that's, uh, that was uh, developed by the city of San Antonio. And so what we've seen, uh, and I guess the ATD's been in place more than 10, 12 years, is that uh, we have not found any issue with those pads at all in that those 12 years that they have been uh, in place. Okay. okay. Are, is the Mr. Brennan, is the agreement we're signing obligating the city in perpetuity to fix the bus pads when they wear out or are severely damaged? Well, they become part of the street and when they become part of the street, uh, we own it and we're going to have to maintain it. Uh, I guess if the bus pad was uh, uh, a problem in itself, we could just get rid of the bus pad and go back to regular pavement or whatever. It'd probably be up to us. I don't think we're contractually bound to replace the bus pads exactly as they're installed or constructed. We're just obligated to keep the street uh, in condition to where it's usable for the bus system as well as all other public transportation or all other transportation systems. I wanted to ask the mayor a question. Um, as you know, that street for years was not our street. It was the county street. And they just said, here it's yours. Did we ever accept it? Uh, you know, Douglas, I'd, I want to do some homework on that because that was under... Uh, I'm not putting you off. Uh, I think that uh, it had to do something with some uh, things that we did to expand. In other words, we wanted something else done on that street, and so we assumed the responsibility of it. But I don't, I don't want to answer that until I have a chance to look and, and find out. But I'm sure we did. I'm sure we accepted it, and I think it was in 1999. Um, 98, 99. Well, the, re the reason I ask that is because um, Commissioner Wolf came here. John had just gotten on the council, and he came to discuss streets through our committee. Remember that? I think that was in 2009. And he told us, by the way, you all own this street. Nobody knew this. You didn't know it. I didn't know it. I didn't know who owned the street. But... I, they said, well, we just decided we were going to give it back to Castle Hill. Mr. Brennan, can somebody give you a street? Do we have to accept the street? Do they just, it's yours? No, the city doesn't have to accept a street. Does uh, it have to be the acceptance in a legally written document? Uh, there's a lot of different ways of acceptance, but there has to be some act of acceptance uh, for a city to be bound to mm -hmm. own or operate or protect and maintain the street. So the question I have is, do we even own this street? Well, have we I accepted think, this street or not? I think the last time that any work, any substantial work was done on this, and uh, you know, not to call, it, call any names out, but I think it was under Mr. Anderson, is when uh, you know, this street was, yeah, so. Um, Textot was doing the widening of that street to whatever they were doing there. You know. Okay. along with uh, Northwest Military Highway, which is a farm-to-market road. 
that well, was real quick, just for a clarification, I came on in 2013, not 2009. Okay. Okay, good. About yeah. that. Well, I, I, I submit that we can't agree one way or another to this if we don't know whether we know whether we even own the street or not, whether we have legally accepted the street. Comment on that, Mr. Brennan? Well, I don't know exactly, but if we've taken over the operation, the maintenance uh, of the street, we've accepted it. Uh, and I- How do you define maintenance? Uh, paving it, uh, fixing the holes. Uh, yeah, we, we, we repaired- all, all along West Avenue, we repaired potholes, we crack sealed it. There's, a, there's been maintenance work done on that street for years. Any one pothole we may have fixed on West Avenue is inclusive of the entire street. Yeah. Well, pro well uh, probably. Uh, you know, I assume from the, the southern city limits and the northern city limits of West Avenue is a city street. It's, it's not a TxDOT street, right? It was a county street for years. Okay. Well. That's why County Commissioner Wolf came and told that little surprise to us that, by the way, you all own the street. Well, the county... Uh, streets that were owned by the county at one time, but they're in the incorporated limits of a city, uh, become the city's street, part of the street responsibility of the city. Uh, and and, and those, th those are governmental transfers or governmental assumptions. It's automatic that uh, county roads and streets in a city become city streets. Uh, TxDOT is a different thing. You know, they, they keep maintenance and ownership of their streets separately, but the county doesn't operate or maintain streets in a city in city limits. So Mike, in your opinion, West Avenue is property of the city council? Yeah, yeah, it's a city street. Okay, thank you. Okay. I have a few thank more you. comments? Uh, sure, but hang on folks, let's get down the line here. Go ahead. Did you have another question? And the reason you close the two bus stops where East and West Castle meet, which is right next to St. George's Church where there's an enormous amount of, of people who mull around in that area, you chose it because riders were not getting on and off those stops? Correct. And based on the adjacent stops to it that are receiving improvements, either with the form of the bus pad or the shelter, felt it would be more beneficial for the city and for VIA to help consolidate these stops. By the way, thank you for this. This is a lot of information. Now, on the last page, page 16, the amenity estimate of $45,000, that's above and beyond the grant of $368,000. Who pays for the amenity estimate? That comes out of the $12 million passenger amenity program fund that I referenced at the beginning of the presentation. Thank you so much. Right, Thank you, Douglas. Um, Matt, before I ask my, I was gonna ask my questions last, so did you have something you wanted to I just, ask? I had the same question okay. Douglas had about the amenity. I totally agree with what John said. The point of the bus pad is to mitigate the wear and it would make it a lot more reliable in the future. Okay. So that's, that's all I have. Most of, uh, in fact, everybody up here stole my thunder. So uh, one thing I did want to reiterate, how many bus pads have failed that you know of in the past? Past? We're not aware of any that have failed, sir. Okay. The only reason I say that is I, uh, for those of you who know, been around a while, my dad, when he, uh, he had a Tim Howell story here. My dad poured our concrete driveway uh, 10 inches thick, ironically enough. And when I changed my driveway, the guy said that to run it around the back of my house was going to take uh, two days to jackhammer that up. Two weeks later, <laughs> anyway, he was still at it to my wife's dismay. So, anyway, other than that, okay, so we've got a, may I make a comment? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, no, I was going to see if there was any 
Any, but did you have another question? Yeah, well, I just wanted to make a comment or a question for Mr. Brennan, actually. Uh, as it stands right now, any damage to Castle Hill streets is responsibility of Castle Hills, correct? Yes, sir. I mean, I, uh, that's a correct general statement, yes. So if VIA were to continue to operate on the streets and continue to damage those areas over time, we would still be responsible, correct? Yes, sir. So in theory, it would make sense to allow them to invest in our city so to strengthen that weak point in the road and minimize additional wear over time. Yes, that, that's a, it's a, a significant benefit for the city for this to happen. Okay, thank you, sir. I think we all remember that when this came up, what, two years ago? We talked about this 400,000. We had talked about when these improvements would be made. Well, guess what? Today's the day. Yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. So with that said, we have a uh, gentleman has presented uh, his thing. I'm going to reread this and ask for a motion, please, to discuss and consider entering into an interlocal agreement with the VIA Metropolitan Transit for funding of transit infrastructure and improvements within the city of Castle Hills. Do I have a motion? A motion. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Uh, we've already discussed, but I, I will ask one more time for a discussion. I guess not. Okay. So with that said, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's Thank go you, build Mayor. some Thank bus you, stops. Thank you very much for being here this evening and everything. Shauna, thanks for being a resident here. Everything you do. Okay. All right, let's move on to item six, which is discuss and consider approving the transfer of $2,404.51 from the C the CPS seed fund to the Perry Burnham Memorial Fund for the final costs associated with the installation of the memorial clock in the commons. Uh, Council, you have this in your packet. I think we've talked about this a number of times just to kind of bring the public up. Perry Burnham left uh, $10,000. A gentleman is Right over there in the second uh, picture frame, uh, second group of pic third group of picture frames, first picture. Mr. Burnham and his wife Madeline uh, were some of the originals in Castle Hills. And he left $10,000 to about uh, nine years ago, believe it or not, nine whole years, to help our common situation, which didn't even exist back then. Uh, you know, when, when he, uh, well, I think the commons was, but we really didn't have much going on out there. And he wanted us to use that money to uh, put something that we would enjoy and, and, and in Castle Hill spirit. We went through every single item that we could possibly put there from a gazebo to a, uh, anyway, it, it took nine years to figure it out. And here we are, we now have a clock. We have a clock in the, in the commons, and uh, we ran over about $2,404.51. So with that said, Council, we're asking you to come up with that money and take it directly out of our seed fund, which doesn't affect our general fund, as you know. And do I have a motion for I this motion. item? Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Go ahead. One or two little minor questions. Uh, the additional 2500 came about because the delay of the purchase of the clock the clock went up that amount in that correct that's my understanding yes sir there was initially back in march of 2016 you had to make up that that 2500 dollars difference thank you also douglas i will want to point out we also did some enhancement on the electric on that uh, we went ahead and did it right for a change like uh, building all the electric and conduit and running it off the building and back up and where this, so, so we won't have a problem, you know what I mean? So they did a fantastic job, Rick, Rick, Rick's not here. He's not here, right. 
uh, Rick and his guys did a lot of that labor. So we have a motion and we also have a second. Uh, all in favor? Thank you very much, Council. It's unanimous. Now let's move on to item seven. This is consider requesting the Zoning Commission to change section 50-564A, Notice of Public Hearings of the City's Zoning Ordinance by Public Notice of the Board of Adjustment, Public Hearings on the City's website in compliance with Local Government Code 211.010D. Council, you have this item in your packet. Uh, I'm gonna ask for a, a motion and a second just to get this on the table and then we'll go into full discussion if you'd like. Thank you, Douglas. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Trevino. Uh, let's start with Douglas. Douglas, did you want to comment or did you want explanation further? Good deal. Mr. Squire, did you want any further discussion? Yeah, I just was trying to understand. This is for the zoning and also correction of the Board of Adjustment? That's correct. So for both, it's for both of our, both of those uh, commissions? That's correct. Okay, no questions, no further questions, thanks. Mr. Daggett, did you have any questions? No, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Trevino, any additions? No, sir. Thank you very much. We have a motion, we have a second on the table. Discussion was limited, thank you very much. All in favor? It is unanimous again. Number eight, consider the acknowledgement of receipt of the 2016 third quarter investment report. Uh, let's get a motion and a second on the table, then we'll uh, move on into discussion. Do I have a motion, please? Second. Second. Okay, thank you, Mr. Trevino, again. Uh, Douglas? Catherine, when you uh, see uh, Suzanne, I can never remember that, I've got her name. Be sure, uh, we have a uh, $200,000 bond, $204,000 uh, bond that matures the 16th. Today, with you have a new economic reality with Trump. The 10-year bond went from 192 to 207 in one day. And that estimate, that is a clear indication that we, uh, at least the bond market people, are expecting substantial increase of inflation and interest rates in under this new administration. Therefore, when this rolls over, buy a tip bond. That's a treasury bond that adjusts its yield if inflation comes up. And you might go out uh, I don't know, you're, I see you're going out one year. You might go out four years. Just a suggestion. And the council, if they have a other idea, that is fine with me. And uh, the quarter of a million dollar bond that matured in October 1, I, uh, my memory fails me at that point. What replaced that? Douglas, I, if you could find out for me, I'd appreciate it. Douglas, could I ask you yep. uh, that you get with Suzanne in the next couple of days? Uh, as of as of December first, she's going to be required in these meetings. But up until then, can you get with her tomorrow to make sure she sure. totally well, understands where week. we're going? That's fine. Ladies and gentlemen, Douglas is the treasurer of the city, so uh, <coughs> that would probably be a good idea. Any other comments, or should we go ahead and vote? Okay. Thank you. All in favor? It is unanimous. Thank you very much. The last item on the agenda is nine, and it is announcements by the City Council. Um, Mr. Trevino, did you have any announcements? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, as you had mentioned before, the City of San Antonio has a bond package. In that, there is all kinds of things. Uh, specifically affecting us is the flooding. Uh, Councilman Cryer had put together a committee to study how the flooding to the north is the stormwater is affecting the city of Castle Hills. Uh, it's my understanding that with so much going on, it's important to stay in front of these issues so they remember that we are affected by that. Uh, just want to point out that the city of San Antonio is having a street and drainage committee meeting tomorrow at the San Antonio Public Library at 600 Soledad Avenue. I will be there if you can make it. It's probably a good idea for you to do that as well. 
It's tomorrow from 6 to 8, and they're also having another one on November 28th. Mr. Trevino, do you think that'll include the $37 million uh, budget that'll affect our uh, thing over here, $37 million <coughs> proposal? I don't know for sure. From what I understand, it's just an open forum to talk about uh, issues that are related to the bond. Wow. Okay, Mr. Uh, Daggett, did you have any questions or comments? No, I just want to again thank the chief and the police department. Um, saw firsthand uh, what happened today. Would have never had it been in another city. They, they're awesome. So, thank you, Mr. Clark. Just a comment on the uh, on the effort that you put forth to. Uh, First of all, uh, before I get into that, I just want to thank Mr. Trevino for bringing that up. We need to continue to look outside the city, and we need to continue to integrate ourselves and then utilize those resources and leverage them for use in our city. So I appreciate you making the announcement and also for committing to be there as representative of the city of Castle Hills. I hope you get a good, good few words in, in our behalf. Uh, second of all, I want to thank you, Mayor, for, uh, for your work in looking at uh, combining the uh, street uh, committee and the drainage committee. Um, I have a lot of respect for, for Mr. Gregory. I think he's going to, I think working together, we're going to be able to tackle some issues that have really stymied the street committee. Um, what we found is a lot of streets that we've been wanting to work on have a lot of drainage issues, and it's really uh, impacted the process to uh, try to move forward on the next uh, uh, phase of streets. Uh, Douglas has taken the time over the last probably two, maybe three months now, to attend uh, the majority of those meetings and his input is valuable and I think what we're doing just makes sense it'll make us more efficient and we got two good heads in there they're going to continue to help help our city out so I for one certainly appreciate that I'm looking forward to uh, the work that we're going to do together going forward thank you John Mr. Gregory do you have any comments or did you want to uh, stroke Mr. only Squire? thing I can think of is what John McLaughlin used to say at the end of the McLaughlin group in November. He says, Happy Thanksgiving, gobble, gobble. Okay. Uh, they stole my thunder tonight, but I can't tell you how proud I am of, of uh, the chief. He's going to have a head as big as a basketball by the time he leaves here. But uh, we, as I said, we had a uh, alleged, I get to say that, I see it on TV a lot. We had an alleged break in of one of our council members' cars. Uh, and and we've caught the what do they call that the uh, well not the perpetrator the uh, they say it on criminal minds all the time uh, the sub oh he's not a suspect anyway we we'll have to watch TV but anyway we we <laughs> the the uh, person who we think did this and uh, it was kind of a unique situation with uh, electronics in play. A uh, gentleman used uh, allegedly. Uh, oh, he did. Thank you, thank you, Chief. Now that we're alive on UStream, uh, he used the uh, Matt's credit card, and within an hour, all the way across town, uh, we had him surrounded. Uh, we picked him up without incident, believe it or not. And uh, you know, we've got a great bunch of guys amazing bunch of guys who you know this happened last night sometime between two in the morning and we had him uh, uh, allegedly in the uh, holding cell within uh, 24 hours so man I, that's great also um, I want to thank you two John and and Douglas for for coming together on this on this uh, committee and and uh, agreeing to do that because we've got the best minds right here a gentleman that like i said earlier has walked every single inch probably of every single drainage ditch in this city no doubt about it and then john with his progress on the streets we're moving forward we're going to continue to move forward once we get phase two we're going on to phase three and this aggressive plan as pay as you go at the moment is working so thanks everyone and uh, other than that i think i'm gonna ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. All right. All in favor? Thanks.
another one right here. So he went over there. <laughs> so, Yeah. 